eventually consistent. Yeah. This hangout is on air is live. Great. Awesome. Aloha, everybody, and uh, Bruce in particular. Does Bruce still watch? Oh, I don't know, but uh, if we don't say hello to Bruce, who's going to say hello to Bruce? Anyway, right. welcome to our second edition of GXG Music, the music show where none of us know anything that we're actually talking about, and we just make shit up as we go along. Woo! Who does number two work for? <laughs> I don't know, but I've lost my lucky charms. <laughs> anyway, uh, panelists for this evening, we've got Jason. And Hi. Jim, Hi. And alternate universe Peter. Hey. Is it Bizarro Peter? Uh, I do have uh, facial hair, so I think that's the... <laughs> Yeah, That's yeah, the you criteria. see. Yeah, in order in order to be the alternate universe, somebody you have got to have a bad goatee, preferably. But any facial hair will really work. So anyway, um, so I'm going to get to start off with a question that I haven't asked any of you before, or rather, more like a more like a, a request for comments. So so yesterday. Actually, this wasn't really just yesterday, but last week Jim had mentioned in our show about uh, uh, cover store, cover songs that are better than the originals. Jim had mentioned Richard Cheese, who is, uh, you know, I think everybody here would that's familiar with Richard Cheese would agree with me that he's a fine musician doing fine work. Uh, so anyway, so because of that, I'd actually been listening to... Uh, a number of Richard Cheese's albums over the last week. And I kind of came to this startling realization while I was in the car. And the realization was that even though Richard Cheese is not punk rock per se, he's totally punk rock. So this leads me to wanting to feeling like we need to develop a unified theory of punk rock. So that's so that's so not punk rock of you, Peter. <laughs> no, no, unified theory of punk rock is totally punk rock. Okay, so because here's what here's what got me. I noticed that on that for most of Richard Cheese's tracks, you've got the basic you've got the basic outline of punk rock. You've got songs that are generally really short. Most of them clock in at roughly two minutes. You've got something that kind of I wouldn't necessarily call it like a hook or really catchy. It just it just like hits hard and fast. And even the slower, more mild stuff tends to catch you right away that he does. And you know, if you recall, especially early Ramones, you know, you could they could they could probably blow through fifteen to twenty tr songs in a thirty minute set, right? Yes. Okay, and they'd have the same basic thing. It wasn't necessarily going to be the hardest sound you've ever heard, but it was gonna it was gonna catch you really quick. You see what I'm you see kind of what I'm getting at here? This doesn't necessarily make sense. I know it's not a fully formed theory, but that's why I'm putting out putting out requests for comments. That sounds like the theme songs for commercials. <laughs> well, kind of, you know, in a way, punk rock kind of is the theme songs and commercials of the music world, only. Less commercial. Are you At getting least. all Demolition Man on me? We're going to be singing commercials. We could be. Yeah. I was so thinking, how many, wow, how any, how many any commercial part? jingles can you sing, Jim? Oh God. All of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, anyway. except I can't sing, so. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Whew. So I don't know enough about Richard Cheese to uh, to agree or disagree with your assessment. Um, I, I think punk rock is all in the attitude. Quite yeah. frankly, um, and all I've heard of Richard Cheese is the thirty or forty-five seconds or so that you included in the previous podcast. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest he certainly has the attitude of bucking the trend and doing what he wants and portraying the music in the way that he feels is appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's or, inappro seems or inappropriate, well. as the case may be. Exactly, inappropriate to the song, but appropriate to how he wants to interpret it. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. suggest that that is very punk rock. Yeah, I'd agree. Jim, comments. No, I, I can't disagree. I think that he's definitely very punk rock. Um, I still think that trying to come up with a unified theory of punk rockness is well. No, I'm like like I said, that's wrong. just why is that wrong? Uh, it just strikes me as being very anti-punk rock. 
Well, it's, are, if you're going to discuss it, punk rock, don't you mm -hmm. kind of need to not be the opposite of punk rock? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, punk rock is supposedly all about sort of bucking the system and, uh, and nonconformity, but, man, like, you look at some of the punk rock outfits out there, and, I mean, it's a uniform. Uh, <laughs> it is really the uniform of revolution. You could argue that, uh, that the punk rock was punk rock right up until the time they started marketing T-shirts and banners and badges and things like that. Oh, you mean I think like it was, about the I, time that you can get a Ramones shirt in Hot Topic? I was I was thinking even <laughs> earlier than that with uh, the Sex Pistols and once they started marketing oh, themselves. But so you, there you go. Yes, yes, exactly. I, I think the conformity happened even before that, right? I mean, you know, it was uh, uh, the, the amount of effort required to look like you just didn't care what you looked like uh, is is pretty substantial. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of effort to roll out of bed looking like you just rolled out of bed. Or to, you know, just convey uh, fuck society, like, continuously. True. I think, you know what, I hate to say it, um, I, I don't know, I use the Sex Pistols as my sort of quintessential fuck society, you know, punk rock protest band. Maybe I should use the Ramones, I'm not sure. But I've seen more interviews with Johnny Rotten later on in life, and it seems like, especially as he got older, it seems like an act. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I... I the, the sort of the magic of punk rock is gone when I can see through that and recognize it as an act. When they were younger and sort of crazier and it seemed like it was off the cuff, it might have still been an act, but mm -hmm. it seemed like it was more spontaneous and grew out of the situation that I believed in it more. Now, well, Jason, do you think that that had anything to do with the age that you were at the time that you believed it? You know, I I don't know if it was necessarily my age. It certainly could have been. I also wonder if it could be the band because as I'm saying that and I think back to the Ramones and I think back to interviews that I've seen with Joey Ramone, I never quite got the, the feeling that it was an act from him, that, that everything was, was, you know, was truly sort of spontaneous and in the moment and that's who they were, that it wasn't like all of a sudden Johnny Rotten steps on stage and he's Johnny Rotten and when he steps off stage he's, you know, Phil something or other. You know, I, I always got the impression, you know, uh, that that for the Sex Pistols, it was an act, but the difference in the beginning was that they were still learning how to act. I could believe that. You I know, could see that. You know, insofar, they, could, they seemed more spontaneous because they were being more spontaneous, just feeling out the waters. And not necessarily that this was a bad thing or it, that it was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. But, um, you know, it's just a, just a part of the act was figuring out the act in the first place. You know, I don't know if that makes any sense. but you know. oh, it, do, it does, especially in the context of the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. Right, where it certainly seemed like they were learning as they went along. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, in, that, in that same... Res well, I had something that I was about to say, and I just lost it. That's okay. You know, it's very hard to identify with a movement if, if if you're not identifiable in some way, shape, or form. So I think figuring out how to act and, uh, you know, how to look and how to signal something uh, is almost a precondition to having any kind of a, uh, you know, identifiable movement. Yeah, I could agree with that. All right. So, anyway, so just to, just to sum up, unified theory of punk rock... It doesn't really exist yet, but maybe I'll keep working on it. Well, I suppose you could argue that it does exist, and unfortunately the bands that conform to it might not necessarily be punk rock. Abs well, yeah. You know, and Richard Cheese, for example. <laughs> like I said, he's not punk rock, but as far as I'm concerned, he's totally punk rock. All right. Uh, for those of you who may have joined us midstream, uh, we've just gotten past our first segment of the second episode of GXG Music, and now we're going to move on to the homework from last week. As, uh, as oh, geez, scary. As our loyal listeners may, uh, may recall, uh, the homework was for our panelists to uh, listen to and now provide comments on uh, Janelle Monet's 2010 album, The Arc Android, and uh, the uh, the album is more or less uh, kind of hip hop rap ish. 
uh, though there are a number of styles present in the album. And uh, in it, Janelle Monet portrays a character uh, known as Cindy Mayweather, who's kind of a kind of an android. Well, not kind of an android. Absolutely an android. And uh, it's kind of a concept album. Really, you can look at it at it like kind of whole cloth and and see that. So I'm kind of curious what our panelists thought of it, and I'll just go from my right on the screen, and we'll progress leftward. So I'm going to start with Peter. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think you, um, you know, the the diversity of it was certainly the thing that struck me. I mean, I, I kind of tried to, you know, uh, pigeonhole it into a genre, and as sort of each track went by, I found, found it sort of breaking what I thought the genre was. There was clearly something that unified everything. Uh, be, I mean, just beyond the Android concept, there, there was a musical uh, th there was something musically that sort of pervaded the whole thing, right? Kind of, uh, kind of a an overall ouvoir. Yeah, but unrelated uh, to the actual music. But stylistically, yeah, it was mm. uh, it was all over the map. It was pretty. Uh, th there was a lot of uh, I don't know virtuosity in in sort of the exploration of different genres of music. I thought it was quite quite lovely. All right. Uh, were there any particular any particular moments you liked better than others? You know, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm. It was kind of a long listen, and I have to say that this week was uh, was a bit of a challenge to sit down and, and listen to it in depth. So I, I don't think that I can call out sort of one moment that I thought was interesting. Uh, although I, I was also struck uh, by one sort of characteristic, and that was, um, you know. In a, as a concept sort of album, it reminded me a lot of uh, of Sun Ra with Space is the Place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. And and I think with your with your mentioning that it's a kind of longer album. I mean, it clocks in at I don't know somewhere around seventy minutes, which yeah. for you know a modern piece of pop is that's pretty lengthy. That that is lengthy. Yeah. All right. Any is there anything you disliked? Uh, you know, it, it's this isn't my uh, sort of normal jam, uh, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be what I would listen to, probably ordinarily. But I found I found it very listenable and very enjoyable. Uh, th so there wasn't anything that I was sort of like repulsed by. Well, that's an outs. That's uh, that's not an <laughs> overwhelming ovation. I yeah, sorry what. about that. I you know. I'm <laughs> I liked it, but it didn't make me gag. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. So I guess we'll move on here. Jim, do you have any anything you'd like to bring up about the album in particular? Well, yeah. The first time I listened to it, I immediately liked it. But mm -hmm. on subsequent listens, I find that I've liked it less and less. And mm -hmm. after stopping listening to it and just thinking about it for uh, probably like five days, I think the reason that I like it less and less is that it reminds me more and more of other music that I like more. Um, I know I said in the thread that it really reminded me of uh, the Supreme Beings of Leisure, who mm -hmm. are relatively unheard of, unless you know me and I talk about them to you. But um, it's, I, it was it was good, the Janelle Monet, um, but it, there's just other stuff like it that I think I prefer to listen to. And um, one song in particular, I was listening to, and I'm like, man, I know this song. Why do I know this song? And uh, I looked at the track list, and it was. Uh, Tightrope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably um, the probably the most uh, single friendly track on the album. Yeah, but not just that. But it's um, the Pharrell Williams song "Happy" is that song. Well, though to be fair, "Happy" kind of came out a couple right of years after. Past. Right. Yeah. But I'm listening to it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I like this. Wait. So I mean, not to take anything away from Tightrope because I thought it was a decent song. That reminded me again of other things, even though this happened in reverse order from um, Janelle's stuff reminding me of the Supreme Beings of Leisure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't dislike it, but I, I find myself now every time I start listening to it wanting to put something else on. Just because it reminds you of that something else. Yeah. So, so is this maybe a case of, of you get something that's too similar to something you already like? I don't know, maybe. Um, it, it, you would think that if it was 
reminiscent of something I already like that I would enjoy it a lot, but it's, I don't know, I guess it's lacking in something that I find in the other artist, and that's what makes me want to put that other artist on. Mm -hmm. is, there a, is there a particular highlight for you? From Janelle? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> okay. Is there a particular low light? No, I, I thought it was very even. I mean, it definitely had some different styles in it. Not every song sounded the same, but mm -hmm. the overall, the, the music, the album, was. It, it, it didn't go to any extremes from, like, like it has a core sound, mm -hmm. and I felt like it stayed pretty true to that. It, it's very consistently produced, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I okay. don't dislike it. I just, it's not on my top, whatever, 20, okay. 50. All right. All right. Jason? So I came out of the gate like Jim. I liked it initially upon listening to it. And it felt like it was really two albums. And, and I kind of see that looking at the track listing, where the, she's got a, a Sweet 2 overture and a Sweet 3 overture. I'm kind of curious where Sweet 1 overture oh, is. Yeah, quite yeah, sweet, uh, sweet 1 refers to her first release, which was an EP. And it, it, it feels yeah. like, like, like in the old days of a side A and a side B or a side 1 and a side 2, um, where there are different feelings to it. And, and so initially I, I really liked the first half of the album. I thought it was good, it was very upbeat, I liked a lot of the tunes, and then as I got into the second half of the album, some of the tunes became um, not quite slow jam, but the tempo was slower and I, I wasn't nearly as into it as I was the first half. And I, I let it go for about a week or so, maybe not a week, but a, a couple of days without listening to it again. And when I came back to it I found that there was more that I liked on the second half than the original listen. And I think that some distance allowed me to see that, that the first half is kind of overpowering. It's very in your face, it's very well produced, it's very up tempo, and then when she slows it down a little bit, if you're not sort of expecting that, it can seem like it's a letdown. Um, I found it very well produced. I liked the way that they did the production of it, and that brings up one of my pet peeves. I, I went out and I bought the album through uh, Amazon, I guess it was, electronically. So I've got the music, I've got the tracks, I've got the album art, but I've got none of the liner notes. So to Jim's point, is it, one of the songs feels like it's Pharrell's Happy. I can't even go back to look at the liner notes and see who the producer was for the album or for the song, where it was recorded. Perhaps there's a reason it sounds like that. Maybe he was a producer, maybe he was involved, maybe it was recorded by the same sound engineer. And I can't find that information with the, the product that I've bought. And I realize that that's a, that's a niche market. There's not a lot of people that care one way or the other. But, you know, a lot of times you'd like to follow the producers. Hey, I like this one album by this one band. It turns out that it's produced by this other guy, and he produced this new album by this new band. Perhaps I should listen to that. Perhaps it's the, the fingers, the, the input of the producer that I like, not necessarily the band. So that's sort of frustrating that I can't follow that thread, but that's secondary to the, to the rest of the album. I liked a lot of the tones of the album. Um, to Peter's point, I tried to pigeonhole this as a particular genre, and I can't. Uh, this is not my normal style of music, so calling it R&B or um, hip-hop, maybe that fits, maybe that doesn't hit, but a lot of the instruments used within it, a lot of the tones of the instruments surprised me. It felt like there was an awful lot of sort of 70s classic rock guitar going in to a couple of the songs that I just was not expecting, quite frankly, from the initial listen to it that came mm -hmm. out after a couple of listens. So I liked it quite a lot. It, it, it's something that I would go back to and, and listen or even put on at a party for you know something up-tempo and good. Pleasantly surprised. Good. All right. Um, you know, because I obviously I, uh, I assigned the homework, it's pretty obvious. I think this is a pretty good album, and I said outright that this is... This is one of my favorite albums of the last five-ish years, so I think that probably comes as no surprise to anybody. If I were to give this a, a, a letter grade, you know, your traditional A to F scale, I'd probably give this an A minus, and a, a, a minus probably just because there are a couple moments that I think don't work quite well within the framework of the of the entire concept. Uh, the one track with uh, with of Montreal, I think, uh, make the bus. Uh, I think that kind of is a. 
I don't think it it really works all that well um, within the context of all the other songs. It's very jarring to hear their vocalist in his kind of nasal avant garde ish Oh, I was garde ish ness. <laughs> I was thinking of Mushrooms and Roses, where it becomes very psychedelic and just doesn't seem to mix with the rest of the album. Yeah, I, I can like see that, I like but... the tune, but it it is it's a sore thumb. It sticks out from the rest of the album. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think the letter grade thing's a good idea. Peter, quick, give me a letter grade on this album. Oh man, you see now now you've uh, you, you've <laughs> caught me out here. Like I, I don't feel like I, I listened to it enough times that I could really give it a good um, you know letter grade. I mean, I, I, I think and this kind of goes back to what Jason was talking about with um, you know maybe finding a bit more uh, substance in the B side after subsequent listens, and you know that seems pretty consistent with my listening too because you know on my sort of listen through the A side you know is the side that grabs me is the part that you know brings me you know brings me in right away but on the uh, but typically what I'll find is that albums will work like this for me uh, there will be the tracks that draw me to the album and then there are the tracks that I can listen to over and over again later on so uh, letter grade ooh. Uh, I'd have to say I'd have to say a good solid B plus, uh, but maybe it would grow on me if I listened to it more. Okay, Jim. I'd have to give it a B. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jason. I was thinking probably a B plus initially, and that that's I I um, that's probably because the particular style is not things that I would listen to that frequently, so it's difficult to judge quality compared with the rest of the style. I liked mm-hmm. it quite a lot. So B plus or maybe a, you know maybe an A minus. Okay, great. Sounds good. All right. So I guess we'll we'll move on to the to the mainstream of this evening's symposium, uh, which is uh, the topic I, I proposed here was on instrumental music. And uh, I think it's just kind of a kind of a general open topic. Some some stuff you like, some stuff you don't. Are there are there things that work better with without vocals than with some tracks where where maybe it would be great as an, an instrumental piece, but the vocalist messes it up. <laughs> things like that. Does anybody want to start us off with any comments on it? Don't all jump. Five, four, three. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. I, I'll say generally when it comes to, to vocals, uh, I, I'm kind of a, uh, I guess I'm a band bigot in that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, having grown up playing a musical instrument, uh, for, for me, you know, it's all about the instruments and uh, what's going on with, with those. And uh, I tend to, I, I think I still have a bias uh, where I will listen, you know, kind of for... I don't know, mood or, uh, you know, kind of at a superficial level to music that has lyrics to it. But mm-hmm. if I'm really, like, listening to the music and I'm kind of doing, like, you know, serious music listening, I, I tend to be listening to instrumental music. And, uh, I don't know, that may be my bias for uh, for sort of classical and jazz um, with kind of maybe, uh, I don't know, I listen to pop and rock and, uh, you know, genres that use more lyrics. Uh sort of in a different way. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that, say, for example, last week, I think you brought up Charlie Hunter at one point, you know, which is uh, which is jazz with, uh, I don't know, a lot of time, he's got a harder edge on a lot of a lot of things, more with some rock influences. And I think, I don't know if he's ever, if he's recorded anything with a vocalist, but everything I've heard of him has been, has been totally instrumental. There, there have been a few bits where he's done some vocals, but it kind of tends to be more. Um, uh, it, it's sort of a, it's secondary to the music. Uh, it's, it's vocals added in, sort of as like another timbre to the, uh, to what's going on in the background. It, it tends not to be the, uh, sort of the message of the song. You know, there. I mean, I guess a lot of songs with lyrics tend to have kind of a, a message or a theme or you know some sort of poetic element to the lyrics themselves and. Uh, that that's certainly not the way that uh, Charlie Hunter uses those. 
someone's going to find a counterexample and be like, ah, but surely you you know listen to the <laughs> such and such album <laughs> where it's all like Pablo Neruda translated or something. <laughs> and you'll be like, oh crap, they found me out. I'm a fraud. <laughs> I'm a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> Don't kick me out of the podcast, guys. <laughs> you know, that, when they find out that you're a fraud, they'll find out the rest of us are too. So don't worry about it. Sweet. <laughs> what are the disclosure? Um, what are the disclosure requirements for uh, a podcast of this type? <laughs> disclosure requirement that that portends that we have any disclosure whatsoever. Ooh, oh, that right. is a, that is a brilliant lead-in. So, quick show of hands. Who here has, if not musical talent, musical training? Peter, you need to raise your hand over there. I I am. Yeah. Oh, are you? Oh, I yeah, didn't see, see your hand there. Oh, there. weird. And so, all right. right in front of my face. So, yeah. Next quick show of hands. Who, this is going to be an easy question, who enjoys instrumentals? Who likes instrumentals? Right? Me. Wait a minute. I, you didn't raise your hand on either of I am with you. Right? <laughs> I like instrumentals. I find them difficult to listen to. Um they end up being background music for me. There are few and far, um, the times are few and far between when I actually key in to what is happening. I find that, like Peter, I have to be a more engaged, a more active listener with instrumentals. I grew up on a fair amount of classical symphonic music. I grew up on a fair amount of jazz music. Um, my dad was a music major in college that uh, eventually reached the point of his of his musical talent and, and couldn't continue with that degree and had to switch over to a business major. Um, and wait, I, I, wait, wait. You, you mean he couldn't hack it as a musician so he had to go into business? That is correct. Isn't that kind of the opposite of the stereotype? Well, eventually he made it in the military, so that's even worse, I think. <laughs> okay. business degree. Um, and, and so my, my, my point that I am trying to make is that I, I think that not necessarily enjoyment of, but engagement with instrumental music probably is better accomplished with some type of musical knowledge, right? That you can see and spot the movements within instrumental music better because you have some fundamental knowledge of music and how music works and the interplay between notes and melodies and chord structures and things like that. Even if you're not a talented musician, even if you haven't studied a lot of musical theory, I would suggest there's probably some innate ability that you, you know, understand that better. Now, I like instrumental music. I'm a big jam bands fan. I like things that go on without a lot of lyrics, but I find that if I am not paying fairly close attention, it's like uh, like a stream in the background. It just goes beyond. It goes past me, and I'm not paying a lot of attention to it. And every once in a while, I can, and I cannot tell you what it is that does that. It's a chord progression. It's it's uh, a synchronization between different members of the band, and all of a sudden, it locks in, and I recognize, and it focuses my yes, exactly, it focuses my attention on what's going on with the music. But if I don't continue that sort of strict focus, it just disappears again into the background. And that doesn't matter if it's jazz, it doesn't matter if it's classical, if it's Beethoven, if it's Bach, if it's Mozart, it doesn't matter if it's the Grateful Dead or Fish, that a lot of times the instrumental pieces just sort of percolate in the background until some point where it, it, it synchronizes with my perception. And I think that's I don't think that's a fault of the music. I think that's a fault of the, the listener that I just there are some things that I do not appreciate fully unless I'm paying attention to it. And I think the lyrics are probably a shortcut to that. That it's something for me to to, to hang my hat on and to, to follow without having to follow that closely. Hmm. I, All right, I, I think you're wait. attributing too much to um, to any musical uh, ability that, to those uh, uh, to those of us who li- like instrumental music. <laughs> I'm not sure that I uh, actually have any sort of musical talent or skill these days. So uh, I, I think it's a generous interpretation that you have. <laughs> Well, I think, but I think, uh, I think, insofar as that's concerned, you know, it, not the, not that the ability to, it's not necessarily the ability to perform that defines, that defines us. It's, it's having been exposed to the, to the ability to make music. I think it's the aptitude, quite frankly. It's the recognition of what's mm-hmm. going on within the music, not necessarily that you can reproduce it. Mm-hmm. It's like right? there's a. 
I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff I know that that I would have heard, you know, as a as a as a younger child that I would have liked, but not been able not been able to appreciate in the same way that I did when I was, uh, you know, after I had gone through, you know, school and and gone through what eight years of band and <laughs> band class and all that good stuff. You know, I, I freely admit that it, it it's also you know somewhat personal or subjective. I I quite like Baroque music. I, I like you know Johann Sebastian Bach. But part of the reason why I like that is because the structure of the music. It's something that I can follow easily. I can I, I can't see the notes, but I can see the structure of what he's doing. I like Wagner for the same reason. I can follow Wagner because of his use of light motifs. Mm-hmm. But then you get into some of the other composers and so, uh, some of the jazz musicians that where I don't I I can't see the structure so I can't appreciate the music right. itself and as a result it just it's elevator music it's in the background I, I I'm not paying attention any longer. So do you mean that along the lines of you can't really wrap your head around what he's trying to put together so that is, that is exactly so you it. just kind of so you just kind of tune out because it's like well it's gibberish so it's background. I, I don't know if it's necessarily gibberish, but yes, it's very close to that. Okay. So uh, I'm going to recommend that we not listen to Sun Ra then, if you're uh, <laughs> if you're not no. uh, interested in music that doesn't have a lot of structure to it. <laughs> well, I, again, right? I, I listen to a lot of jam bands. I like the, a lot of the Grateful Dead, and they have a, a particular section of their live shows. The two sections, really, one called drums, where it's the the two drummers or percussionists, and they're just beating out whatever they, they, they feel they need to beat out. And then eventually it goes into a section called space where the rest of the band comes in and they sort of input these different, you know, whatever they're feeling at the time. And I don't so much like the space jams, but what amazes me is how one person plays a note or a series of notes that sparks something in someone else and all of a sudden it just gels and the band locks in. And it's like a school of fish, and they turn, and all of a sudden they're playing the next song. Have Have you ever seen a video recording of Frank Zappa performing? No. Okay. Heard a lot. Of, heard a lot of Zappa, but not seen performing. Okay. You, I think Frank Zappa is the kind of guy who it's it's really easy to appreciate the music just listening, but to appreciate him as a band leader, you really have to see him, because. It because the way he constructed his uh, his uh, his various bands, uh, he found guys who could follow direction really really well and at the drop of a hat. So like, you know, just making particular gestures, you know, just just like, I don't know, like a flick of the wrist, he can say to the whole band, okay, you're switching style, you're playing the you're gonna keep playing the same song, but you're gonna change the style you're playing it. Okay, and it's not something that comes across like listening to just listening to a recording because, you know, you think okay, well they had that planned out, but they might not have. He might have just said okay, switch. He and, was also some. He was also somewhat legendary for um, sort of having brutal requirements for his band members in terms of like music theory. I mean, pretty much all those guys had to be able to play just about any lick imaginable in any key, uh, sort of on command as well, and that's a that's no mean feat. <laughs> I I remember hearing an interview with Steve Vai, who played with with Zappa for a while, and he was talking about how he had gone to audition for for Zappa, and it took like all day and was put through this totally brutal. Brutal routine where where he was told, okay, you're gonna play this song, okay, that was good. Now play it in this style, okay, play it in that style. Now change the key, you know, all of these shifting requirements, you know. And by the end of the day, Vi thought, okay, I really fucked that up. I am totally not getting this gig. And and Frank basically, basically, I think if I remember the interview correctly, he basically turned to him and said, well, okay. Uh, you're coming with us, you know. After having been put totally through the ringer, he was like, "Okay, and you have to be on stage tomorrow." <laughs> Pack your bags, let's go. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I think I heard the same interview. Uh, it, it sounded like a grueling process. Uh, I, I 
have to say that I love listening to Frank Zappa, but uh, I, I don't I think, think I could have ever worked with terrifying. Him. <laughs> yeah, it definitely, definitely among my my. Uh, uh, if if there were a platonic form for uh, masochistic musician, I think Frank Zappa would have come closest to it. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, now that we've gone into a little theory, are there any particular instrumental albums that anybody wants to recommend or or discuss? Albums or tracks? Well, why don't we we can go either way. We can start with do you want to, do you have something in mind, Jim? No. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to know if we were going to be doing we can, entire albums or, we can or particular do, tracks. We can like do either. Got... I'm not I'm not picky. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, since I seem to have interrupted everything, I'll um, a, as a uh, a former hair metal aficionado. I obviously have leanings in my instrumental uh, uh, tendencies towards like Satriani and Vi. Um, but oddly enough, I think my, my favorite instrumental piece is the uh, non-vocal Carol of the Bells and, okay. um, and uh, Edvard Grieg's In the Hall of the Mountain King. Ooh, that's a good one. Good option. It's like two minutes and 20 seconds of just awesome. <laughs> It's actually not quite as fun to to play, I must say, because no. it's 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 like fifteen minutes of total tedium and boredom, followed by two minutes of panic and mayhem. Right. Well, that's got to be like Ravel's Bolero too. Yeah, you got to yeah. go through an awful lot to get to the good part there. Well, you know, uh, as, as a trombone player uh, and and one who spent you know, many years playing in orchestra, mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say that it's not uncommon for trombonists, uh, uh, particularly, well, even professional trombonists in major symphonies to have reading material that they, uh, that they read through while they're waiting for their entrance. And, um, you know, it's sort of like count 700 measures of rest and then, uh, and then, you know, unleash mm -hmm. the cannons. <laughs> well, that's all the trombones are good for, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, as, you know. I guess it depends on the uh, uh, it, uh, depends on the trombonist, but I, you know, there are some trombonists that have been accused of having uh, the dynamic range of on or off. <laughs> By the way, I should note at this point that we have a have a have a question posted from uh, a Ms. Katie Springle Lemka, where it's one word and it says blasphemy. Now I'm not sure if this is. Is that a this, question or a statement? The well, answer is yes, please. <laughs> uh, Katie, Katie follows us up with saying that Hall of the Mountain King is super fun to play on the piano. So she must be responding to my uh, to my 15 minutes of boredom and two minutes of panic and mayhem. <laughs> so thank you, Katie, for your. Uh, I, I still want to know if it was comment. a question or a... I, I, well, I mean, with Katie, you can never be too sure. Though she does have a very good mastery of the language, sometimes it could be a emotions request. get in the way. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, all right, Peter, is there a, a particular work piece, album, song, track... Whatever. Oh man, you know I, I listen to so much that's instrumental that it would be really hard for me. To, I mean, you know, this is like asking me what my favorite music okay. of all time is. And Here, so that, why don't I uh, why don't I uh, narrow it down for you? Let's say contemporary, and we'll say something with a good horn line. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what I've been listening to a bunch lately uh, is uh, I, I've been listening to Herbie Hancock's Headhunters album a bunch lately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's a sort of a classic instrumental funk album uh, that that's not too uh, not too crazy out there or, or unlistenable. I think it's a very uh, I think it has some uh, characteristics that make it good for popular listening, uh, and and it's all instrumental. All right, Headhunters. I think that's a pretty good choice. Jason, what you got something to follow up with? To headhunters? Oh, a lot. No, anything. So, I, <laughs> not necessarily to headhunters, but you know. 
like I said, I grew up listening to a lot of classical music and a lot of jazz music. Thanks, or not so much thanks to my dad. Um, probably colored me for life. So there's a lot of instrumental tracks that I, I like quite a bit. Um, I, I, I said earlier, I like Bach and I like Wagner. I love um, Tristan and Isolde by Wagner. And one of the things that I like about that is the way that he starts the music is that he clears the space, he clears the room that the music is going to be listened in by the opening chords that just go on for about a minute. Two different chords, well it might be more than that, I'm not, not a music guy. Um, it sounds like two different chords that just reverberate and, and sort of expand the room in which he's going to portray the rest of the music. That's just incredible. I, I, I like it quite a lot. Um, and then I, I like uh, uh, John Coltrane's Love Supreme. Right? It's just phenomenal, um, sort of typical instrumental jazz, I guess. Right? It's one of the top five albums that every jazz person has to talk about. I like that a lot. Um, one of the things I find that helps me with instrumentals, and I'm, I'm not big on, on recent instrumentals, quite frankly, but one of the things that, that helps me is, is finding out the context of the instrumental. Um, it helps me sort of, of, of understand what's going on. Again, without the signpost of a, of a lyric to sort of hang my storytelling upon, it just devolves into the background. So understanding uh, you know, some of the, the things that Beethoven wrote symphonies about or in response to helped me appreciate the music a little bit more um, because now I understand you know, certain movements within them that before understanding the context, I have no idea what the music was about, so to speak. Just sounded like a good piece of music. Hey, I like all these instruments playing together. I like the way that it moves here and moves there. But understanding that there's a, a greater purpose, that there's a reason why he wrote it, and understanding the reason why he wrote it sort of helps me appreciate it a little bit more. Well, what about in the instance where it doesn't necessarily have a reason? Just oh, music I probably, for the I sake probably of don't music. like that crap. Okay. <laughs> On the other hand, right, I, I like, um, I used to like, I haven't listened to it in a long time, so I don't know if I still like it. I used to like a lot of industrial instrumentalists, like Skinny Puppy, that are noise artists. They put together these tracks of samples of almost ambient noise, um, and they form a tune out of it that years ago I liked, and like I said, I haven't listened to it in a long time, so that might indicate how much I like it still. Okay, so for people who may be watching this who aren't necessarily familiar with Skinny Puppy, you want to just throw out a track or two? Oh, all right. Hang on a second. Let me look it up in my uh, my music database here. Database. You, you know, know for... uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I was going to say, well, uh, while, while he's looking that up, um, uh, you know, we, we could actually generate our own noise on this podcast. This is maybe a, a topic for next week. We just all <laughs> scream into our microphones. We could do wait, that. Wait, haven't we been doing that for the last... 40 minutes or so. <laughs> well, we'll just rely on you to edit down, edit it down into like musical tracks. Oh, someone, that be someone who has been in band for eight years could potentially assign different uh, instruments, so to speak, that we could all emulate and put together. <laughs> <laughs> Call dibs that on sounds, the ocarina. That sounds like madness. So I, I have I have yes. one album in particular that I remember I used to listen to a lot from Skinny Puppy. It's called Last Rites. It was released in 1992. Mm -hmm. For the life of me, I can't. There's no track on it that particularly stands out. So that would indicate how much I enjoyed the music, or at least how much I remember of it. Mhm. Mm All right. Sounds like a good place to start. I've heard that one myself, and it is pretty good. All right. Uh, so in regards to in regards to use of the human human voice in instrumental music, so at what at what point do, does the human voice being present actually make the track non instrumental per se? You know, as in, does do you actually have to have words, or is the human voice being there at all make it not strictly instrumental? I think you have to have words. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Or at least, okay, define a word. Least. <laughs> well, at least sentences. I mean, you can sing a chord, you can sing a note without it necessarily being a word. Mm -hmm. I mean, hello, a cappella groups. Yeah. So, you know, it's the, just because there's a voice doesn't necessarily make it words or language. It's, it can still be music, although music is a language, so i got to watch out because I know Katie's listening. <laughs> She'll get all over <laughs> me for it. Yeah. 
but no, I, I guess Peter, it doesn't. If there's a voice, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not instrumental. Okay. Hmm. I would agree with that. Right, that the voice is an instrument as well, and I think it's once you in, once you bring in lyrics or identifiable words that that uh, that changes it from an instrumental tune. So you could have you know jazz scat that would still be considered an instrumental. See, I I don't know. See, I was just thinking about the uh, about scat, and um, and I was thinking that uh, listen to me about this kind of podcast, Peter. <laughs> oh. Ooh, the podcast just turned blue here. Ooh, Shiza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'd actually uh, uh, posit that scat uh, that scat jazz vocals are in fact uh, you know that's vocal music um, mm -hmm. you know I think you know how about something like um, you know Minnie the Moocher or something uh, I don't think it goes uh, you know when it goes from the sort of the lyrical parts to the parts where he's you know singing scat uh, I'm just trying to come up with an example that everyone might be able to think right. of here um, of course, it was on the Blues Brothers, and everyone's seen the Blues Brothers or their mm -hmm. uh, apostates. Um, heretics, any, blasphemy. Yes, heretics, blasphemy. Okay. Uh, are we integrating anger properly into this podcast yet? Well, we certainly could, but if I can interrupt for just a, just a moment, uh, uh, Jimbo, uh, who is a regular watcher slash slash listener and by the way Jimbo I apologize for not seeing your questions last uh, last time we were on with this one uh, has has in two words brought up kind of another point to this whole uh, vocals as instrument or as or as lyrics uh, the first one is tequila and the second word is wipeout okay there you have with both of those you have you have largely instrumental tracks I would call them have, instrumentals yeah, and you have one spoken word basically in each of them. Really good tracks. So, but are they are they still instrumentals even despite the one word? Jason Bob says yes. Jason Bob says yes. Okay. Jim yeah. Bob says yes. I yeah, agree. I gotta agree. Okay. How many how many words do you need? <laughs> uh, seven. Seven. Precisely seven. <laughs> do okay. I hear nine? How about ten? All right. <laughs> And then, then Katie also brings up a brings brings up another point, and I think this goes back to goes back to uh, words that, uh, or rather, use of the voice that isn't that you don't necessarily perceive as as being a language. Uh, and she writes, by that rationale, is a song in a language you don't understand slash speak an instrumental. Hey, this is America. Um, it's not music any longer. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, along those along those lines, uh, I have a have a number of of bands by uh, by groups that perform like uh, Afro pop and Afro funk kind of kind of stuff, who are singing in languages that I can't even identify. You know. And because I don't have any any basis on, I know that they're singing words, or at least I have the impression. But because I don't have any basis to identify what exactly they're singing about, or or can even identify particular words within it, you know, to my reptilian brain, it's you know, it's as good as an instrumental. You know, so. Do we... I suspect it's context, honestly. Yeah. Right. That that perhaps a, a native speaker of that language would not consider it instrumental because they understand the vocalizations, they understand the words. Mm -hmm. Or then you might you might run into run into an artist such as I'm going to throw out one that I'm not sure anybody else is going to recognize, but Diamanda Galas, who's very, very avant-garde and dark and spooky and screams in very interesting ways, who is definitely singing in languages I understand, but in kind of ways that I just don't understand, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I mean, this is a woman who has like a gajillion octave range and can sing in like eight different languages and is really creepy looking. Oh boy, I've lost everybody. You're gonna include some clips, right? Uh, oh, I've got in the oh, edited version, right? 
I can hardly wait for creepy screaming. I want to drink from the fire hose on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, I'm going to go off topic a little bit, but uh, uh, not you. Come on, not me. But uh, Diamante Galas's album "Malediction and Prayer" is the first album that that the where even though I couldn't get through the first track, like the first dozen times I tried listening to the to the album. It turned into one of my favorite albums of all time. This is a difficult album to listen to. And it it rewards repeated listenings because you feel like by the time you got through it, you've accomplished something. So this is kind of like the B-side phenomenon that we were talking about earlier. Only only really spooky and scary. Like the whole album's a B-side, or maybe even a C-side. <laughs> It's more. It's more into the <laughs> more into the Q side, I'd say. Ooh. This is this is like nothing you've ever heard before. I can almost guarantee. No, I can't guarantee you, but I can come pretty close to it. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I I was the kid in high school who was into into Schoenberg, so uh, <laughs> no. you're, you're gonna put some uh, uh, Schoenberg clips in here right now. I'm assuming. <laughs> I might. You might have to help me identify a good one. Oh, by the I, I way, think it sounds oh, like the sorry. pairing would be good. <laughs> All right. Oh, by the way, Katie is now asking if Dr. Feelgood is an, is an instrumental. <laughs> I don't think so, Katie, even though he's the one that makes us feel all right. <laughs> uh, all right, so what else do we got going on here? Don't leave me hanging. Wait, are, are you looking for like an alternative subject or? Uh... No, no, if you just throw out something, that either on subject here. or off. Uh, rem remind me what the topic was again. I've got we, a short. We're talking about span. instrumental music. Oh right. <laughs> right. Is there is there one you want to recommend? A track or an album or an artist? Well, I've already gone here, so someone else. Yeah, is don't have don't to worry. I'll edit out the awkward silence later. <laughs> so this will be four minutes long. <laughs> no, be like no, that no. John Remember, Cage. I'll add a bunch of clips that will get us up to about fifteen. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Solid. Dang. All right. That was my instrumental we've exhausted silence. ourselves then. Yeah? No? Maybe? Okay. Down there. Okay. I think we've about exhausted ourselves. Oh, yes, there was one final piece here. Uh, I wanted, you know, I could assign homework for our next one, another album for everybody to listen to, but I'd rather somebody else did it this week because it can't all be about me. Go on, Peter. Sure, make it all about you. No, no, that's okay. It can be all about you, but we can use a different Peter. What? I'm, I'm confused now. I don't like oh, the sense of this. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't that kind of podcast. That's right. We, I may have clicked the 18 plus button. That doesn't mean we can go into that sort of thing. All right. Uh, so... I'm just going to pick somebody here if somebody doesn't step up. As Jim's looking around and trying to pretend that... He... Go on, Jim. Give us, a, give us homework. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm unprepared for that. Oh, come on, Jim. I know you listen to a lot of stuff. There's got to be something in your repertoire that, may, that most of us haven't heard. I'm, I'm sure what, there is, but that doesn't mean it's any good. <laughs> What was that, Jason? What's the criteria? The, the criteria is that it's an album that we should go listen to that we probably have not heard before. That's it. Well, okay, I'll go. Since I mentioned yeah. it in both posts and on this podcast, why don't you guys look up the Supreme Beings of Leisure? Give them a listen, and I'd be um, interested to see if you guys can or what you think of them, and whether or not the Janelle Monet thing that I've experienced making me want to listen to them applies to anybody else or not. 
Okay, Ooh, so you've choice. given us an artist. Give us give us a particular album. Um, well, they've only got three. So it should be an easy choice. Right. There's a, a self-titled one, and then uh, the other one is called Divine Operating System. So, I mean, if you pick wait, either of those... Said, wait, you said there were three, but then you just gave us two. Yeah, well, the other one is really just a couple of songs long, and it's not worth talking about, so... All right, so you do... Te well, technically, they have three. Okay. The, the, the so two that have any real substance to them are the self-titled one, Supreme right. Beings of Leisure, or Divine Operating System. All right, so... And they're quite one? a bit older um, than the Janelle Monet. That's fine. Which one? Just pick one. Which, I know it's which, like picking your favorite child, your favorite child, but um, I'd have to say a divine operating system would all be there. Right. I think we're all nerds in our other lives, so anything with operating system in the title is probably going to appeal to most <laughs> wait, wait, of us. Wait, wait, wait! You think we're all nerds in our other lives? I hate to admit that, Peter. I was drawn to that just based on that. Yeah, we were all thinking it. <laughs> Ooh, divine right. operating system. I can get behind that. So, so which Absolutely. operating system would the divine operating system be? Uh, QNX? No, Amiga <laughs> DOS. Oh, wow. No. It's VMS. Everyone knows that. Commodore. <laughs> now, now people are just throwing you things out. Can't really call, you can't call Commodore's a... a Disk operating system because it didn't require a disk to operate. It was built in. Well, it doesn't have to be just, a disk operating system. It just and has to be an operating system. Right. And if it's divine, it doesn't need any changes. It's already a DOS. It's a divine DOS, divine See? operating system, right there. Yeah, but it was basic. It's not exactly divine. Hey, <laughs> if if you can't get everything you need to get done in a couple couple numbered go to statements then you're just trying to be too complex. <laughs> Go to fail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think... I th Okay, so our assignment for next time, and I know Katie's probably still watching, so Katie, you have to do this too, is uh, Supreme Beings of Leisure's uh, album Divine Operating System. It's I'm from uh, to it. 2002. 2002. 2002. All right. So thank you for joining us, all of our faithful, loyal listeners, and we will see you at some point in the future.